Welcome back to A Celtic State of Mind. I'm Paul John Dykes and this afternoon I am delighted to be joined by Brian Degnan and Mr Jim Orr, or what we like to call you Jim, the Oracle. Here you are. And if we do get anybody else coming in, um, it will be uh, I'll be delighted to see them as well because you guys, uh, your energy is going to be required today. I'm not feeling ropey, I'm just feeling a little tired after a wee uh, morning drive up from Liverpool. And if uh, you haven't seen it on our socials, and I won't labour the fact, I just wanted to say thank you to everybody who voted for us for this gong, which is a, a football content award for the best content creator international. So we were in the international category, and Axon won the gong. We were in another category as well, uh, which was, let me just double check that one, it was the best podcast international, and that was won by the Totally Football Show. So... Great night was had, and thank you, every single one of you, for voting, and every one of our contributors, and every single person that supports the show. Uh, absolutely buzzing about that, Jim, and it's a great accolade for the whole team, isn't it? Well done, young man. I mean, this is this is your thing. Uh, you've done an astonishing job. I mean, not just me, just sitting in for chat. You're the guy who's behind the scenes is doing an incredible amount. Uh, daily bulletins. I mean, who else does that? Uh, the amount of time that you put into this uh, match day stuff, before the match, half time, after the match, the money you raise for charity is quite astonishing. Whether it's St Mary's or Jamie Tierney organising matches with St Rocks, giving Jerry Taylor the game and goals, yeah, above and beyond the call of duty. Uh, so well done, you. Uh, you thoroughly deserve it for all the work you put in. Uh, well done. I appreciate that, Jim, and also appreciate every single member of the team because it is a team. And a member of that team is waiting in the wings. It's Mr. Alan Morrison. Here he is. And uh, I'm sure we will have Sorry, loads to discuss. No, it's great to see you, Alan. It's absolutely brilliant to see you. Um, Friday afternoon, just giving out big thanks for all the <coughs> Axom voters and all the contributors. It's a real thrill to go down there. And um, I think what happens with the speeches, because uh, there's a bit of banter flying about. And if uh, Leeds United get mentioned, there's booze or Man U, Man City, whatever. So when you go up there, you want to just say a few words and get off that stage before uh, people start getting sick of the sound of you. Uh, but the point I made was that people who do this can inspire great things to happen. And Jim mentioned the charity, and I, I mentioned the fact that um, as a community, Axom's raised an incredible amount, 100 grand for charity, and we'll keep doing it. And there will be news of the charity weekend. They're coming very, very soon, um, a date in December will be set. One final thing I want to say about it, uh, I was sitting next to Aaron Fraser, who won the Best Young Content Creator. Uh, Scottish boy who is doing some sterling work, so it was great to meet him. And also Sam North, who whose football adventures, footy adventures, were in the same category as Axon. He was sitting at our table. And uh, the Anfield Drap, who are a platform who have helped us from the early, early days. It was great to see them all. But uh, let's have a wee chat about the football, shall we? Brian. Plenty to discuss, and I found it interesting last night. Celtic had a, a bounce game, a friendly, and it was the second time this this season that we've played a testimonial game, and we've sent a fairly strong side um, to Dundee as we did earlier in the season against Air United. Last night it was for Cami uh, Cami Kerr, and previously it was uh, Michael Moffat. And what we found was five what you would ex kind of expect to be in first team squads, five players. Um, all played the game. It was Scott Bain, Stephen Welsh, Yuki Kobayashi, Gustav Lagerbjelk and Alexandro Bernabe. Um, and when I was looking at it, I was thinking, great, they're getting game time. It's maybe not the best in terms of the competition, Brian, and the level, because these things are all about fun. And there was ex-pros. Darren Day was on the bench for Dundee, etc. But I think what it does show is that we do need a platform for these guys. Um, Brendan Rodgers obviously has seen two opportunities to send guys including Tilio and Johnston earlier in the season and Quan to go and get games. But it shows that there's a real dearth of opportunities to do that, Brian. We need to have something in place, a platform where these guys can play more regularly. Absolutely. It's um, it's, it's always quite sad when you think that we don't have a, a reserve league anymore because <clears throat> I remember when the, the B squad sort of lower league announcement was made and mm. I suppose my rationale for it was the fact that I think competitive games at any level are probably better than just training. However, when the reserve league, you had that mixture of senior pros, guys from match injury and youth, and that was a, a better mix and I think a bit more productive. Um, and especially with guys like, like say, Stephen Mills, who 
clearly Roger sees has been an important part of the squad. It's good to get him back playing, back for injury, see what he can do. And you've got to imagine guys like, you know, Lagerbilk and Kobayashi probably won't get a lot of game time this season. So any game time, any chance to impress or any chance to scales it, as I call it, um, to, to really state your state your claim and, and take advantage of an opportunity, I think is key. So it's good to see them getting game time. Um, you just you do wish there was a better sort of structural thing, but if you want to talk about structures <coughs> within the, the Scottish League, we could be here for a, a couple of hours. Yeah, we could, and it's interesting that he has uh, entered the um, the, the vernacular is it, of Scottish football, um, like George Best in it, but if you Liam scales it, it's something completely different. Which of the, the players that I mentioned, Brian, you know, Welsh has been given a new contract. Um, of, and, and it's interesting that I'm asking the question of, of Lagerbjörk, which do you see uh, from the five having a future under Brennan Rodgers? Because there's a few doubts in amongst that group, isn't there? Yeah, I think so. And actually, probably the most surprising is the doubts around Lagerbjörk. And I know he played a couple of games, but it felt as if maybe, I don't know if it's fair to say the games came too early for him or it was because of injuries, but I think there's some concerns that, you know, we've heard rumblings that Rogers isn't a fan and it'd be interesting to see what happens there, especially after, I think, he signed a four-year deal. So, so that's an interesting one. Kobayashi, you would imagine, will probably go. I think even under Ange, we saw at the end of last season, it probably wasn't cutting it. I think that's when um, Tomoki sort of came into the picture and started playing yeah. centre-half more instead of Kobayashi. So it sort of shows where his future lies. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernabe, I, I think there's a player there, but I suspect that whether it's a behavioural thing or a, a you know a, a character thing, it doesn't look like he's going to play much. Uh, I think he's got loads of ability. And actually, I said at the start of the season, um, one of the many things I've been wrong is that I thought he'd have played more <laughs> than Taylor. I thought he was he was more suited to a Rogers team, a traditional fullback, with a bit more athleticism than Taylor. Um, so I. Uh, to be honest, if Stephen Mills hadn't signed a new contract, I would probably have said I don't see any of them featuring moving forward. But given the fact that Welsh had a new contract, you've got to assume he'll at least be there in some capacity for the rest of the season. Yeah. It's interesting yourself and James uh, have started the Alexandro Burnaby cult CSC. Uh, still big fans after all this time. Who knows what will happen because Liam Scales and previous to him, Tony Ralston, have reminded us that you know, be very, very careful as to who you write off. Um, Alan, what's your take on the five guys and the fact that, we, you know, we're, we're using exhibition games to give these guys game time because there's no other opportunities for it? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we need to remember that we some people give the club a lot of stick, uh, both in terms of, you know, in terms of, you know, no youth players coming through, etc. And then, you know, um, you, you why why aren't why why aren't why aren't we developing our own players? Well, there's a lot of brick bats get thrown that way, but we've got to remember that structurally, Scottish football simply does not provide young players a pathway to first team football at the Premier League level. It just simply doesn't exist, and that's a structural issue that is on the hands of the SFA, who are responsible for um, development. Right? Uh, you know, the, the SPFL they only care about the clubs they only care about essentially you know the first teams of those professional clubs the sfa are responsible for youth football and for development and, uh, and they've utterly failed to provide a pathway for those young players so let's so we need to remember that and celtic have tried to be as innovative as they can within the constraints of scotland they've managed to negotiate to get their b team into the lowland league uh, but ultimately it's the fifth tier of scottish football and the best will in the world, playing Stirling University students is not really a, gr a great preparation for Premier League football. So this season, they've um, again gone out and formed a relationship with a, a Austrian second division team, Ad Ad Admira Ovaka. And mm -hmm. I think three lads, I think at the moment, are, are out there on loan. I don't think they're getting a lot of game time, but let's... You know, but it, it looks like we're moving to a model where those that show promise in the B team will then the, the Austria gig potentially, and that's seen as being uh, a gateway. On top of, you know, we've seen successful loans for players. <clears throat> we've seen Ralston at St. Johnston, Scales at Aberdeen, McGregor at Notts County, going back a wee bit further, etc. So mm -hmm. we have seen some successful use of loaning players to competitive leagues a little bit lower down the pyramids in England or Scotland, but at least 
they um, they're getting competitive men's senior football. Um, yeah. But it's a conundrum, uh, and until you know Celtic are, are not landlocked into this um, terrible uh, you know system for developing players, there's there's only so much the the club can do. I'm not saying the club couldn't do a better job of developing players. That's always the case, mm. but. Um, you know, again and again, it comes down to you know you've got a big squad of players. Now this is where I'm going to you know try and be balanced here. And I, I said at the beginning of June, uh, you, I think we, I think I was on here or huddle breakdown or whatever, saying what is the to do list for the board, uh, for the for the football operation? It's to, it's to get rid of a whole, quite a lot of players from the payroll that are clearly not going to be part of weren't part of Angie's plans, are not going to be part of uh, Roger's plans. And again, we did a poor job i'll be honest with you we did a poor job in the in the summer of getting rid of players that aren't going to feature now we did get rid of uragidi we got rid of ayeti we got rid of sorrow hazard these are all players that weren't going to feature but then in, and barkas actually as well but then in addition we, we we lost quite a few players that we didn't want to necessarily lose but um so there's but there's still you know anything up to eight nine ten players on the payroll senior professionals yeah. That have got no prospect of, of football, so it's 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 an, it's 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 a it's a difficult it's so difficult. Well, I mean, what 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 do you do? You know, if you think there there's some hope for them, like I would argue that Lager Bielka is too early to be writing him off, but somebody like Kobayashi, you know, he's a senior player, no prospect of being in this in the match squad. What does he do for football? There's just there's, there is no answer to that unless you you look. So it's 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 it's, yeah, it's it's a mess, and it's it's one that Scottish football. It's squarely on the hands of the of the SFA, as I say. It's ludicrous. It really is. I mean, I remember uh, Brian McClare, uh, a man who uh, I've got loads of time for. I think he's a great advocate of Scottish football. He gets a, a top role at the SFA and it doesn't last because he's got ideas that uh, go against the grain. Uh, fifth tier, absolutely, Alan. The club are trying their, their damnedest to, to do something. Uh, they're getting a partnership with Admira Vaca. Fifth-year football and the game stops us from uh, getting any kind of promotion. People have said to me, "Oh, you know, you're sitting in such and such a position; you wouldn't be promoted anyway." But um, if, for example, that was opened up to more of a reserve team rather <laughs> than a, a, a solely youth side, where there was a hybrid of youth, but like the, the lineup last night, hybrid of youth players with the fringe players, then I'm pretty sure that the progress would would happen. And another. Um, uh, mentioned for a player who's gone out on loan and done really well, according to St. Johnston fans, was um, Adam Montgomery. Obviously, a bad injury down at Fleetwood, but uh, a player who seemed to be benefiting from the loan system. Um, Jim, what so, about yourself? So, well, 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 I would say, well, what else is out there? What do other countries do? Hmm. I don't know what they do. I mean, we keep saying there's, there's no pathway here, but what do, what do they do? That's, that's question number one I'd ask. Question number two I would pose, and not because I'm some old codger, but the most important thing is experience. Yeah. And that's the thing. I mean, I've said it before the transfer window closed. I thought we were sleeping, sleepwalking into the season. We lost Yakimakis and, and, and Juranovic and, and Minboy and, and Starfelt. And we didn't replace that with experience. And you talk about, I mean, I said at the start when we talked about this, uh, getting into the fifth tier, complete and utter waste of time. And that's what it's been, a complete and utter waste of time. Because Alan said, it, what do you learn playing against students? Hee haw, right? So, what you need to do, and I know you said the reserve league is something that we want to see, but the reason that worked, and you alluded to it earlier, Paul, is you had experienced players playing, that's where they learn from playing with and playing against experienced players. Yeah. The thing I always kind of wondered was when, when players retire, what do they do from a football point of view for the next few years? So, you take somebody like Charlie Mulgrew, say, now Charlie Mulgrew could last 90 minutes. No problem in that B team. Definitely. No problem. You know. Yep. So see between the ages of maybe maybe players retire when they're 33, 34, 30. I'd say between the ages of 33 and 40, these guys can still last 90 minutes, surely. So should there not be something there, whether it's a reserve league or whatever, that maybe you have to have four or five players over the age of 35 in your team, along with young guys as well. And they they would do it for nothing. To keep playing football, it's not going to cost you any more money to do something like that. So you're playing for your younger players, and these guys would be happy to come back and help out. And that's where you learn. That's where you really learn. And that's the bit that's annoyed me. I mean, this is the first time I've been on since Atletico, which mm. was easily the most uncomfortable Celtic match I've ever sat through 
in my puff, basically. Total embarrassment. Individually, collectively, tactically, the whole thing, shocking. And it came, it came after the after the first game, which is, I said last time I was on here, one of the best performances ever. So it went from that to this. And one of the reasons for that is experience and the fact that we didn't buy experienced players over the summer to help out in those kind of situations. And Callum McGregor got a hard time. But if you're Callum McGregor and you're looking around for some help from experienced players, there's nobody there. It's a bunch of young guys that are there. And I've said before, that you don't have to spend loads of money to get experienced players. And the thing I said last time as well, we think the chairman's report was not long out. And they were basically saying, we're sending young guys to make money. That was it. There was nothing about we're bringing in experienced players. And there must be, in my simple mind, and people will say, well, you're not very ambitious doing this, but there must be guys out there playing in the Swedish league, the Polish league, the Belgian league, who maybe had a few caps for the country four or five years ago, 29, 30 years old, who have played in Europe, whether it's the Champions League or the Europa League, 30, 40, 50 times. And they've done known what to do against Atletico. And we were clueless, absolutely clueless. And you're sitting watching the game, and it's like pins. <laughs> it's going to hit me pins the whole game. This is terrible, terrible, terrible. And we're an embarrassment. And as long as we sign young players, it will continue to be like that. We need experienced players in the team. Now, that's a kind of bit of a divergence from talking about the youth team and reserves and stuff like that. But they're all kind of linked in, Absolutely. I think. Mm-hmm. And the Athletic League came a few days after we were at Ross County. And Ross County consistently punch above their weight. You know, they're doing it 10 men after a few minutes. But they made it hard for us. We found it hard to break through for them. Against Athletic we had to be Ross County, you know. I mean, we are not It didn't make it difficult. You're right. You're tonight, right, Matthew. Right. Tonight, Matthew. I'm going to be Ross County. You know, I'm going to make it difficult. I'm going to defend. <laughs> I'm going to. Hope, I'm going to shut down spaces. We didn't do that. We're absolutely clueless, and it was a horrible, horrible watch. And you say, well, you know what? See, Europe, it's too hard. And then a few days later, we hump Aberdeen six nothing. Mm-hmm. It's too easy. It's too mm-hmm. easy. It's too hard. So, as Alan said, we're in the long. We're in the wrong league. Basically, we need to find a league that we can play in that is somewhere in the middle. And I've always advocated that we need a European league based on relegation and uh, going up and down the leagues and based on coefficients. So we're playing teams like uh, Sparta Prague and Ferenc Varos. And it's a proper game of football. It's too easy against Aberdeen and it's too hard against Atletico. So what's the point? What is the point? That's today's rant. Sorry, today's rant. 17 well, I'm looking forward to the second one later on in the show, Jim, because you say that's today's rant and often we get chapter two later on, which I love. But right. see your point about the experienced players. I don't know if you were at the event we did with Brian McClear a few years back in McCool's in, in Glasgow. Uh, but of course, McClear had all that experience working in the academy at Manchester United, um, overseen by Sir Alex Ferguson. And then he gets his big role at the SFA. And he spoke that night, or that day rather, about the fact that he wanted three, I was going to say ex-pros, senior pros, who, as you say, their maybe their, their competitive edge had gone and they're maybe a wee bit too old to make it in the first team, to play in the reserve team. Mm-hmm. Um, and some of the examples he gave were people like Tom McAdam at Celtic, who had long since retired, but was still playing reserve football. And mm-hmm. you would play him alongside a young centre half, and he yeah. would learn more from a ninety yeah. game minute game of football Correct. than yeah. hours and hours and hours of you know powerpoints and all this kind of stuff. So yeah. and video analysis and that. But yeah, it was at the, the exact same point that Brian McClear made. It's something he was trying to push when he got his big job at the SFA. We all know it didn't work out. And, and the thing is, Jim, is if you want uh, total domestic dominance and that, that's your ambition for Celtic, be you a fan or a member of the board, then we're fine. We're doing all right in that respect. But the other end of the scale, if like me, you do have ambitions in Europe, I think you're right. We're in the wrong league. Wasn't it the, um, remember the Alan McDonald thing that he really pushed and it was, they called it, was it G8? They called it G8, didn't they? And it was eight different leagues. And as you say, there was promotion and relegation. So you could be promoted to the league by winning the Scottish division, but you could also be re- relegated back into your domestic league as well. well. The big teams in Europe are pushing for the Super League. And, that, and that, that top division would be the Super League, apart from the fact you can get relegated, because they were after some sort of franchise system, mm-hmm. I think. So your Real's and your uh, Atletico's and Liverpool's and Man City's and Real, all these guys, Division 1. And we're in Division 
whatever we're in, four or five. Because your coefficient is horrendous as well. Is there not something like 50 odd, Alan? Do you know that stuff, Alan? <laughs> I mean, not 50... Alan, Alan is fishing. frozen by the looks is of it. He? He's back, he's back. No, he's, he's laughing now, that means he's back. <laughs> and across the city, there's something like 20-odd or 30-odd, something ridiculous like that. So anyway, that's... And I'm not going to do a rant, it's too early for a second rant. So, okay. Well, I was going to ask you, Jim, you were telling me how um, it was... And again, you've watched Celtic through, you know, Neuchatel Zamax, you've watched Celtic through Slovan Bratislava. Uh, real bad results in European football, as well as the Barcelona's and, and the PSG results, etc. What made it? What made you feel that it could have been the worst? Was it the fact that it could have been quite easily eight or nine on the night? You know, it was one of the games, have, Jim. It could, have, it could have been 10, 11, 12. Yeah. It could have been mm -hmm. anything they wanted. And even when we get, we get hammered by Barcelona and PSG, if you was, I didn't feel like that game the other night where... Every time they came forward, they're going to score. They're hitting the post, they're hitting the bar, Hart was making saves. We were just completely clueless. And then the subs at half time, we came on, you're thinking, no, no, just show up. Mm, we're out of depth yeah. here. Just do a Ross County. Just, you know, don't get involved. Cut spaces. Let's get away here with three or four goal defeat. I think we'd have lost anyway. You know, I thought we'd lose the first game. And in fact, I'd say, uh, in the actual group chat, uh, before the game, I was outside the game, about to go and I said, uh, I envy you guys at home because you can hide behind your couch. I'm at the game. And then they were just at, at half time. I then text, wow, it's mm. just wow at half time. You should never text you in the game. Anyone who texts you in the game should get their phone taken off them. That's just ridiculous thing to do. But half time, I'm thinking, wow, just absolute wow. And you go from that to that. And I know the sending off and that changes the game. But if you're experienced players and you can through that Celtic team, Hart International, Johnson International, CCV International, Scales an International Player, Taylor's an International Player, McGregor's an International Player, O'Reilly, Bernardo was it plays, one of 21 players, Kyogo yeah. International, Maeda International, Power, international players, I, I, and they were, and, and they get played with on the night. And it was embarrassing. It was like sitting there with something like your pins the whole game. Oh, no, no, no. And just stop the game. Please just stop the game. It was a boxing match. It had been stopped five minutes into the second half. No, that's enough. Throw in the towel. It's too much. And Celtic Football Club should never, ever, ever, no. ever get through something like that. So you then take a wee step back, as Alan would do, and say, well, why? Why did it come to this? Well, let's look at the players that we've got on the park. You know, and you, I mean, you've interviewed Martin O'Neill. Not that you need the plug in January. Sell out, phenomenal. And you're kind of Martin O'Neill's best pal these days, right? <laughs> and I've heard Martin O'Neill talk about his team. And he would talk about, we didn't have one captain. It wasn't just maybe Tom Boyd or Lambert, but with Lenny and with Sutton and with yeah. captains, you know, guys you can depend on. As I said earlier, who did Callum McGregor have to say, who's the other captain that I can turn to? Because they played the first Champions League game, Feyenoord, Laga Bielka, first of the game in Europe, sent off. Home, first of the game in Europe, sent off. Yeah. Maybe it's no great surprise that these guys are getting sent off because... It's the first time they've done it. And you get back to what I said a minute ago. This is rant number two. Experience. Experienced players wouldn't do those kind of things. I'm not saying we would win the game. Of course we wouldn't win the game. But we would have a better shape about us. We would know what we were doing. We could just know what to do. And as I said, the, the kind of mythical 29-year-old Swedish guy who's played 50 games in Europe and plays for a top team in Sweden, he'd know what to do in those situations. He'd advise other people. But we didn't have that. We just lose the young guys inexperience, bad shape, bad formation, bad tactics, bad in-game management, bad everything. And Celtic Football Club shouldn't have it. And if I'm an Aberdeen fan, I'd look to last Sunday and I'd say the same thing. Yeah, I'm Aberdeen. I shouldn't be losing 6 nothing to anyone. Despite mm -hmm. the gulf in resources, I shouldn't be losing 6 nothing at Parkhead. I really shouldn't. And if I'm, a, if I'm an Aberdeen fan, I'm appalled by that. I'd be seeing it's like pins stuck in you again going to Celtic Park. And my thinking about the big two leaving Scotland, that would be good for Scottish football. Because if I'm an Aberdeen fan, a Hibs fan, a Hearts fan, I'm never going to see my team win the league. I'm never, ever going to do that. And that's why I always say about when people say, well, the Celtic fans are the best in the world. Of course they're not. Because we're used to winning. With a game this season, not an each against St. Johnson, you can get booed off the park. By sections of the support. Right? <laughs> so how does that make you the best? And, and Celtic fans are great. I'm not having a go at Celtic fans. But just the perception that you know, that we're in any way, shape or form, but it's dead easy to support a big team until you get lost and then you start looking for the excuses. I'd, I'd love to see the the competition being like it was in the 80s and Alan will remember that. Like, 
with Dundee United coming to Celtic Park, and you're thinking, see if we win today, that'll be great because there's some team. Aberdeen, there's some team. Hearts yeah. are really good as well. It was competitive. It's not competitive anymore. And I'd love it. I mean, and they say, well, if you took the big two out, there wouldn't be much money in Scottish football. There's no money in Scottish football as it is. In actual fact, if your hibs or hearts have a chance of winning the league, your crowds are going are gonna to soar. And other people who are not, I mean, like, like us, if, if we were in a different league, would we still pay attention to maybe hibs and hearts? You may actually go to those games. You might actually um, watch those games in the telly. You may want hibs to win the league, you know, so... Rant number two, 2532. <laughs> no, but the thing is, Jim, that you, you go back to the 80s, that will never happen again. Never. You know, the competitive Dundee United, Aberdeen, and even Hearts, remember Hearts almost won the league. Love Street 86, we focus on our side of it, but Hearts then had a fantastic run in Europe where Bayern Munich, now, was it the Cup Winners' Cup or the UEFA Cup? It was the UEFA Cup, wasn't it? And Bayern Munich knocked them out in the quarterfinals, remember? So... They had a right good side in the 80s as well. We don't have it, and it will never happen again because the disparity in finances is so wide. Brilliant point, though, Brian, made by Jim in relation to Martin O'Neill's team. You look around that dressing room, you've got four captains at least in Tom Boyd, Paul Lambert, Jackie McNamara, Neil Lennon, and then you've got the kind of talisman and um, Chris Sutton, Henrik Larson, John Hartson, that, that type of player. And I think it's a great point. It's all brilliant bringing in young guys, developing them, selling them for massive profits. But you're going to have a situation in that cycle where you're looking around that dressing room and you don't have the same level of experience, you know, that you, you could hang your coat on, we'd go to battle with you, etc. because they're still learning. And we've seen that in experience with home and Lagerbilk in the, the first Champions League game against Feyenoord. Um, in relation to where we go in January, I do expect quite a few players, because of what Alan said, we didn't quite get enough out uh, last time round. Um, as is always the case, <coughs> loads of people are going to be linked to Celtic, Brian, but um, what are we going to do in terms of business? Who are we, who are we looking at? Who we, where are we looking to strengthen come January? I, I know a lot of people are concerned with the Asian Cup coming up and the fact that we've got O and Kyogo potentially uh, not uh, at the club for a, a period of time. Um, is that the priority? Is a left-back a priority? Goalkeeper? Midfielder? Where do you reckon we need to strengthen, Brian? I think where we need to strengthen is exactly where we need to strengthen in the summer. I think we still need a left back. I still think we need a, a, a keeper. I still think we need another striker. Um, and then you're looking at the, the midfield and you're going, we've got quite a few midfielders there, but is Tumble going to stay? Are we going to call it a day with him, depending on his contract? If he leaves, we probably need to replace him because regardless of what people think about him, his goal scoring record is excellent. Um, it, it really is. So I think that. Um, the, the, the situation, sadly, is almost exactly the same. Mm. What was interesting, I thought, for Brendan was he was talking about how they would look inward first, they would look internally first, yeah. covering these yeah. positions. Mm -hmm. And if I got quite excited. I thought, well, maybe finally he would give one of the younger guys a chance. But then he was talking about, oh, well, I had used Jimmy Forrest as a, a striker in the past. And you think, it's not really what I'm looking for, Brendan, to be honest. It's, I, I would rather try something. And, and just on the back of Jim's first... Uh, first point, I was going to say first rant, but the first point, um, and the fact when you're looking at these teams that have got experience in, in youth, that should be what your first team is. There's no reason, against Aberdeen, we're feeding up and up, there's no reason we couldn't have brought on a couple of younger guys had even been on the bench to give them a chance to put them in that position competitive and see how they got on. Safe environment, there's no reason that couldn't have happened. When you talk about, Jim talks about, um, and rightly so, these guys learning from senior pros, well, if they were in the dressing room, we can recoup with them, playing even 10, 20 minutes, a game where we're winning, learning, maybe showing up, maybe a visitor injury coming straight in. That's an easier fix then, because we're not going to change the reserve league. To the point Alan and I made at the start, it's structurally, it's, it's the SFA and the Scottish League's no fit for purpose. So we can't change that. The B League's not going to improve anybody. Only how we sort of, how we get our own players moving. And at Jim's point, you see that in other teams like, I know Man United are rotten this season, right? But they still will always bring in one young guy. Some of the young wingers are like 6, 17, 18. They're just playing a game. You still get your 10 first teamers that are, that are doing well and one youngster just to see how they got on. There's no reason we shouldn't be doing that. Um, I think it's a wee bit excuse making at times, if I'm honest, because we say, well, can I do this because of this? Can I do this because of that? It's like, we don't try it. And if it fails, mm -hmm. then you can say you've done it. But if you don't try it at all, there's no excuses. 
No, I agree with that. Uh, Michael McDonald, with Axon winning awards every year, is it just a matter of time before their big stars, you know who you are, depart for pastors new? I'm not sure. Who, who are the big stars, Michael, that you refer to? Um, I can't speak for anyone else, but what I would say is that uh, the way I view this, Axom's my baby, and this is what I do, as Jim said, on a daily be every single day, seven days a week, I work in some way, shape, or form on, on a Celtic state of mind for a number of hours. And uh, if it can be used as a platform for the likes of the brilliant Amy Canavan or the excellent Declan McConville to come in and um, get some experience and move on to Pastors New, we wish them all the very best. Um, because I think, you know, it's nothing, there's nothing better than seeing somebody just flourishing in that environment. Talking of which, flourishing in the environment. Alan Morrison, I want to, you know, pick your brains about Liam Scales, right? Um, I want you to tell me, did you see it coming? Mm. Had you seen anything uh, in previous data, for example, that would suggest he was going to do what he has done? We used to say it was a Tony Ralston moment. It's now a, a, a Liam Scales moment. He scales it. Um, and also the big question that I've seen a lot of is, how long does it last, Alan? How long is it? People have called it a purple patch. Um, Brendan Rogers is talking about new contracts. Where, where are you with this, with, with Liam Scales' resurgence? So, so yeah, Paul, uh, you uh, you can confirm we didn't speak before this show, but yeah, there's an article coming out on this very topic on the Brilliant. Celtic. Um, just just a couple of just before I get into that, there's a lot of things I could talk about in top of Jim's conversation, but I'll just a couple of little facts, if you like. Um, long story short, right, the Atletico Madrid game. To be honest with you, we've seen it before, and it's not to me. It wasn't a surprise. Okay, um, guess how many uh, games Martin O'Neill avoided defeat in away from home in the Champions League group stages? Not many. I'll take the first look. Okay. One, right? One draw. One draw in nine games. Mm -hmm. Go back and got us into the last sixteen twice. Guess how many away games in Champions League group stages he avoided defeat? Not many. No. He lost every single every single away nine. Okay, guess which manager has got the best record of all Celtic managers in Champions League away games? The current guy, Brendan Rodgers. He's avoided he's avoided feet in three games out of eight. All right. So anyway, listen, Liam Scales. So um, he's he's got enough minutes under his belt to do a sort of proper comparison. So what I haven't done yet is done the full sort of scales versus the population of centre backs the Van Dykes, the Ayers, the Juliens, and blah, 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 blah. I've not done that, okay? What I did, what I've, all I've done is I did a straight compare between Starfelt last season and Scales this season. Playing in the right. same position, I think we can all agree Starfelt improved massively over his first season, and him and Carter Vickers were very effective as, as a pair uh, in, the, in that last season. So I'll, I'll try and be brief on this. So in terms of plus points for Scales, he's a much better distributor of the ball. I think we can all see that. Uh, what he doesn't do is he doesn't try extravagant passes. He generally breaks he breaks the first line, so you'll get past the attacking midfielders, etc. So he, he he has a lot of what I call packing passes, which is where you're taking players out of the game, a high volume but low value in terms of they're, they're reasonably safe passes, but he makes them and he progresses the ball well, far better than Starfelt, who 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 was relatively limited in that in that regard. He also wins more aerial duels than um, Starfelt. And again, probably not surprised about that. Scales is a much a much bigger man than, than Starfelt was. And Starfelt tended to get drawn under the ball and try and win headers, which he couldn't, which Scales does have a little bit of that in him. But overall, um, Scales does win slightly more aerial duels than Starfelt. On ground duels, it's the other way around. And this really comes back to probably what is the, the biggest limitation uh, of, of skills compared to Starfelt, which is Starfelt was a very aggressive front foot defender. He always tried to win the ball, even when it wasn't there to be won. Uh, but what he did have is he had very good recovery pace. So if he made a Horlicks of it, he could generally try and get back and recover. Skills doesn't have that. Uh, and we've seen a number of times him being pulled out of position uh, and, and then the play going in, in behind. And I think that's something you just can't, if you've, you've, either, you've either got pace or you don't, and, and Scales doesn't have it. So, you know, and in terms of er error rates, they've both got quite high, far too high error rates for my liking uh, in terms of games. So, you know, my, my position on Starfell, and I think I've said it on this pro, you know, this show many times, was that 
if you're using Carter Vickers as the benchmark, Starfelt was well short of that benchmark for me in terms of what we did at centre back to complement uh, Cameron Carter Vickers. I think Star Skills has slightly different strengths, slightly different weaknesses to Starfelt, but I don't think he, and, and, and I think it's a credit to Skills because Starfelt was an experienced international. He's, two to three years older than Scales. So I think Scales is to be commended for coming in, replacing an experienced player like Starfelt and keeping his place. And I think a lot of people see Scales through the lens of he's a young guy, he's come from the League of Ireland, we thought he was out the door, and it's like a Hollywood sort of success redemption story. Whereas we saw Starfelt as here's an experienced guy for Sweden, he's an international, and we'll judge him accordingly. Now, if you start to look at these things through those prisms, you, you'll you might see the same thing, but you'll come to a different conclusion. My, my conclusion is that neither player is of the standard I want to see at Celtic centre half and nowhere near the level of Cameron Carter Vickers. I'm so happy for Skills, he's done brilliant, but I don't think we're any further forward than where we were last season in terms of improving that position in the team. That That's really interesting in that we've brought in uh, additional centre-halves to try and improve that position in the team. And of course, when we did it, uh, we did it without the knowledge that Scales was going to have this resurrection of sorts, Jim. You know, most of us, Scales included, he's spoken about it, expected him probably to sign a permanent deal at Aberdeen. He'd done really well over the piece. I know that there was uh, tricky times there, uh, Darville being the worst, Jim. But we brought in Nat Phillips on an emergency loan, Novroski on uh, a permanent deal, 4.3, I think. Um, and also the <coughs> aforementioned Lagerbjelk. Uh, but Scales has kept performing and, and kept his place in the team. Long term, uh, Jim, should we should we stop this chat about long term as if it's a wee purple patch and you'll, you'll end up as a backup again, uh, give him a wee bit credit for what he's done, or do you think one of the big signings, and I say big because £4.3 million for Celtic is still a big signing, um, will eventually come in and uh, partner Carter Vickers. Jim or what's your take on it? I've just clicked the unrant button there as I <laughs> saw that sitting there. See, Brian disappeared that question, just in case part three of the rant was on. Before I answer that question, I, I love the stats. I love to to see the stats and, and, and look at them from an objective point of view. And and, and the start Alan caught with there was, 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 was actually quite interesting. But at no point ever in Martin and Neil's tenure did I ever feel embarrassed the way I felt against Atletico Madrid. Uh, and the stats can... Can, 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 can make can, can can give you the answer they want to give you. Uh, we went to Bayern Munich under Martin O'Neill, put them off the park and lost the game. And we lost the game the other night, they're the same thing, basically. So it was about how how poor we were the other night. And I take it, I totally accept the fact that our records are pretty, pretty duff in Europe, but that was a new low for me the other week. In terms of the answer, I agree with Alan that Liam Scales isn't the answer. You, can, you keep feeling like, isn't the boy doing well? Isn't he doing well? Because it's unexpected. Isn't it doing really well? Isn't it doing really well? We do need a better quality of player there. And it's quite interesting that the word quality keeps getting used over the last few weeks. The manager says that. Yeah. Define quality. What is it you understand by the word quality? And for me, it's experience again. I'm going to come back to the same word. Because, uh, you know, there could be a 19-year-old wonder kid playing in the Belgian league. That everyone's trying to buy. We buy him for 10 million. Is that quality when he comes over here, maybe playing in our league, etc.? So, for me, it's about getting quality, and you don't have to spend a lot of money getting that. You need to know where to go, uh, you need to look at the stats because the stats will tell your story as well. We do need more quality, we know the type of player that we need, and Liam Scales has done wonderfully, wonderfully well. But, but he's, he's not a long term answer, and I think we all know that. The big thing again is, um, we do look at it. Uh, through a different prism, as Alan was saying, I think that really interesting because we, we speak a lot of, about biases on this show and you are biased towards certain players, Brian. I mean, it was difficult for a long time to ever give Tony Ralston any credit because people went in a meltdown. It was like, how dare you give him praise? And then eventually a lot of people got turned down by him. I think we're going to get into a position, though, Brian, where we do have players like Liam Scales, Stephen Welsh, Tony Ralston, and there'll be others um, who... You could probably go out there and, and maybe Greg Taylor, I want to talk to Alan about him as well. You could go out there and, and replace them with better quality, going back to what Jim says, uh, if you've got aspirations in, in Europe. But they will fail you pretty well domestically. And it's great to have a, a core of players like that 
that you know they've got the games under the belt now. Ralston never did until Ange came in. Scales he never did really until uh, Brendan Rodgers came in. And you can rely on them. Uh, and, and even if you go into Europe and there's an injury crisis or someone suspended, you know, right, OK, Scales has got all the games under his belt now and you can rely on him. Do you agree with the, the other guys, Jim and Alan, that we will have to do better? And, and we might have that internally already because we've brought in another three centre-halves, one of whom I do expect to go back to Liverpool in January. Uh, Brian, how do you look at it? Or do you think we should get off Scales back and say, you know what, it is a Hollywood story and he's going to stay there and he's going to be the centre-half. and you know, But again... I totally respect Alan's data uh, when it comes to this. And uh, if you got someone who was on a par or on a level in terms of the quality of Carter Vickers, then you're going into these European games with a, a different um, hue entirely on, on proceedings. Uh, what's your take on it, Brian? So I think, you know, it's an, always an interesting thing because there is a cynical part of me that when people talk about, say, scales, Ralston, etc., and they say, oh, he's doing really well, he's given for the jersey, it's really good. And you think, well, that should be a prerequisite for playing at Celtic. You should always give everything to the jersey and do the best you can and, and be able to you know, complete domestically. So, you know, that's a sin because you do like to, you know, support the players and say, well, he is a bit of a surprise. But, of course, longer term, you, you should. it doesn't matter who it is, you should be looking to improve on Carter Vickers. Carter Vickers is comfortably our best defender and has been, but you should always be looking for better. This goes back to that thing about signing project players. I don't necessarily have a huge problem with signing them, but... Don't sign nine in a transfer window. Sign three and three guys that are either three transfers that have a little experience or three loan to buys that you might pay decent money for. That seems more sensible to me. So in terms of the scales thing, again, like Ralston, you always, I think as Celtic fans, we kind of always like to see someone proving people wrong and doing well, especially when they're, they're playing well for, for Celtic. But yeah, longer term, you, you can't, there can't be sentiment in football. Like I know there is in I'm guilty of it as much as anybody, but if there's a player, and this goes for Callum McGregor, Matt O'Reilly, Kyogo, if there's players that are, you can get that are better than what you've got, you have to get them. You have to look to try and get them. You can't ever just say, these guys are really good, we're probably fine. You should always be agile in the market and be looking to see. Um, so I, I think that, yeah, he's done really well and it's, it's good that he's continued to do well, but it's probably indicative of our failures in the transfer window that he is the number one or the number two centre uh, number two centre back choice. I think that's a wee bit of a problem. And just quickly you talked about biases. I mean look at James Forrest, club legend, you know, him, Jinky and Larson, the the hundred goals, hundred assists, and people still slaughter him, can't believe he's in the squad. And and it's like I get he's getting older, but he's still got uses. But he's been having this people have been slaughtering him since he's been eighteen and he debuted. So there is a there is a there is always a weird uh, bias with players. It's like Hatati, like I, I love Hatati as a player, but he's got very clear weaknesses in his game. But I know as Alan's found out, if you're in any way critical of him, people go bonkers, and you go, well, hold on a second, you, you can't you can't even say that guy's perfect and he's brilliant. I remember one time I got absolutely rinsed for saying Kyogo was out of form because then they scored for a bit and people went nuts. And I was like, guys, calm down. If people can have form, they can go up and down. It's all right. Uh, you know his dad you don't defend him people have biases and it's inherent but that's just the kind of nature of football isn't it? it's just what you do <laughs> you're not his dad bro <laughs> talking to Kyogo he is a star yeah. man in this year's Christmas advert um, obviously there's a big focus on the advert I think on the foundation uh, you know rather than looking at the advert as a way of punting all the merchandise they've even had a, a wee kind of tongue in cheek moment at the end I don't know if you've seen it have you seen it, guys? you seen the Christmas advert? So mm. there was a wee um, teaser this morning. I, I won't ruin it for you, okay? But there was a teaser this morning, and then it was premiered at uh, 12. And I've got to say, the production of these things are, is always brilliant. It's worth watching. Uh, but the focus really is on charity and giving, and um, that, I think, the club need commended for, because in the past, we've been trying to punt all this, the Celtic merch uh, with these videos. But there is a wee nod to that at the end. Um Go and give it a watch. You'll see what I mean. Uh, nice and humorous. By the way, here's another big beauty. I'm just going to pull them all out. All the big. Look at the size of that. That's from St. Rocks. Look at that. Brilliant. I'm going to have to get these up on the wall behind me because the wall is looking like a jail cell. But that that came in uh, gratitude from St. Rocks for a Celtic state of mind um, for the centenary game 
that uh, obviously we pulled together the Celtic Select and Brennan Rodgers came along for the second half as well. And it was a game and an experience I will never forget. So thank you very much to The Rock for that. That will take pride of place alongside um, the awards that we've uh, brought in over the years as well. Double Denim comes in. Sorry, guys, at the bottom, this is covering your face. Must start by saying a massive congratulations um, to myself and the Axrom team. Testament to the hard work, commitment and passion for all things Celtic and such a great platform to give a voice to the fans. When people come in and say that, uh, we don't take it lightly. We do appreciate every single one of your uh, comments. Thank you so much for your support and for your votes in getting us down to Liverpool uh, last night. Beautiful stadium, by the way. Anfield, gorgeous stadium. Hadn't actually been to Anfield since 1990. That's how long it uh, has taken me to return. Um, I went to a game in 1990 against Nottingham Forest. I was talking to the Anfield Draft uh, guys last night about this. It was two each. Ian Rush scored the first two. It was 2 nothing at half time, And Nigel, a young Nigel Clough scored two for Nottingham Forest. Two each it was. Uh, brilliant, beautiful stadium. And I've got to say, I took a wander around Anfield last night, guys, just to have a wee look about. And it looks immaculate. Um, I'm not saying I'll, go, I'll go further back than that. Last time I was at Anfield was 77. 77? We beat, we beat Wales 2 nothing. Kendall, we scored and. The famous Joe Jordan handball. That's, I was in the paddock as it was back in the day. They still go on about that handball, Jim. They still oh, go it's on definitely about handball. That handball. Definitely handball. Yeah. VAR would have, would have, would have cancelled that. I no bother. What about yourself, no Alan? Bother. Being based in, in Sheffield at the moment, have you frequented Anfield in the past? I haven't, to be honest. No, never been to right. uh, Anfield. I've been to see Liverpool play a few times in Sheffield, but never been actually been to Anfield. It's definitely uh, on the to-do list. Aye, beautiful stadium. Um, I would recommend it. And uh, we've got Jungle Lion. Great to hear from you, as always. Rogers needs help in January, as we all can see. Uh, just let's hope he gets what's needed. Yeah, do have a wee kind of niggling concern about that. Brennan Rogers was at the game last night, obviously uh, running the rule over some of the fringe players that we mentioned earlier on. And as I said before, every single person coming in with supported messages. Um, they're all read. They're all really, really appreciated. Thank you very much. And Jungle Line goes on to say that he needs uh, at least six to eight players out. That's hard, I know, but that's the reality. When you look at that, Alan, how many do you think we can get out? Because I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, like yourself, we were looking at a lot of the guys you mentioned and thought most of them should have gone out in the summer, but it's, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard to move these guys on, especially if they're on big wages, decent contracts, Player power. I mean, James McCarthy is going to be a hard player to move on, isn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it can be critical, but like you say, you know, players have contracts. They're human beings. They might be comfortable on on, on mm -hmm. where they are, both in terms of where they live and their families and kids at school and all that. Um, so you know, it's not just a case of, of selling people, um, as, as we've seen, but. You know, it is a business, it is a professional game. We can't carry a squad of 30, 33, 34 players um, of whom, you know, eight or nine are just not figuring at all. So there's a number there, you know, I could go through the names, Seagris, Bernabe, Kobayashi, McCarthy, Mikey Johnson, Quan, off the top of my head, you know, that really I don't see are going to play at all <laughs> uh, for Celtic. So really... What we know, why, why you know, we need to try and get them out the door, basically. But that's that's not Brendan Rodgers' job. That's that's uh, Michael Nicholson's job to do that. And then you know, as always, we need to improve. And I think you know, Brian was right. You know, goalkeeper, left back, probably another top striker, really. Um, but it needs to be like you said. We've got enough young development players, if you like. We need to get a bit more uh, experience. I agree with Jim on that one completely. That, that was a big miss over the summer. It wouldn't have made a huge difference in Madrid, I would argue. We could spend all this, I don't know how much money we've got in the bank, 70 million. We could spend all of that and still get beat 6-0 by that Madrid yeah. team, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. So it's just mm -hmm. where, which is where we have to be realistic and clever about, about what we do uh, in terms of the transfer market. You know, I think the, the general direction is good. Um, we're still relatively immature in the trading model game. I think we're easily best of class in Scotland. There's no one comes close to Celtic as far as player trading, but we're actually third division, I would say, in Europe as far as if you look at peer clubs, um, you know, and, and also look at smaller clubs who are trading and performing way above their weight in Europe. 
um, you know, the, like Mitchell Hand a few years ago, as as Ed Altmar, those sort of teams, uh, Salzburg. You know, you know, they're all different stories. It's not a lift and shift. It's not a copy and mm-hmm. paste. You've got to come up with a model that's uh, commensurate with your environment, your country, your 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 business environment, and so on and so forth. Um, but in terms of overall direction of travel, we 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 we're a long way short still of, of having a player trading model that is. Um, I would say, you know, anywhere close to the best of class as far as European benchmarks are concerned. And again, I tend to look at European benchmarks, not Scottish benchmarks. The other thing I was going to say, your word there, realistic. Uh, I totally agree with that, right? And for the first time in a long time, I was listening to a Celtic State of Mind yesterday, not on it, just sitting there listening in the car, in the passenger seat. And of course, we had uh, JP Mason, James McKenzie and Kevin Graham speaking about a lot of these issues that we've been talking about today as well. And there was one point uh, Kev made, and Kevin and I disagree like the rest of us, um, about a player who's maybe worth, uh, t- I think the figure Kev used was 10 to £12 million, pounds, um, wouldn't want to come to Celtic. And the the first example that sprung to my mind, Jim, was Odson Edward. And I felt to myself, there are players out there within that kind of bracket, because that was a few years ago now, um, who would want to come to Celtic. If you sell them the the actual move and and how it can develop their career in the correct way, you can get that quality to Celtic. I don't like just saying, yeah, they wouldn't sign for us anyway, let's not have the ambition. Uh, And I think it's realistic to suggest that there are players within that category, Jim, that we could bring to the club. It's not an exact science. We know it's not an exact science because you're back to quality then. We bought a Yeti. Was he quality? Yeah, he was meant to be quality. Look how that turned out. Barkas, you can say the same thing as well. Spent a lot of money, spent a lot of money in wages. So the higher the fee, the more risk that you're taking. And being a particularly risk averse person, I get a bit of a slag in the past for this. I'm always a bit wary of spending silly money upwards of you know, nine, 10 million a player because it's a huge risk to tie that amount of money up in a transfer fee and also the wages. You don't know who the person's going to fit in. And if it's a young guy, there's a much, much higher risk. And I keep with Alan there, we could say in tons of quality players, but we'll still get hammered in Europe because it's just too hard. All these teams, is too much, too far ahead of us, and domestically, we're too far ahead of them. And it's a bit of a quandary, the whole thing. Uh, as for attracting players, uh, players will come for the money at the end of the day, and a stepping stone to something else. Of course they'll come. Uh, I'd just be wary of spending silly money because uh, as Alan says we are miles behind I mean, I'm mean, i a bit concerned hearing what Alan said there that we are so far behind in areas that I would think are pretty basic you know why are we so far behind Alan why is it taking us to now 2023 to be that far behind some of the teams that you've mentioned in Europe who we dwarf financially but they're, they're better than us so you have to ask a question then about who's been running the club for the past yeah. number of years to, to be that far behind because we have to be best the best that we can be in all areas of the club and if we're falling behind in those areas then that has a knock-on effect to everything else and the bit about being totally embarrassed and athletic but it could have been 10, 12, nothing take a couple of steps back and start thinking well why is that and Alan's just mentioned a few there that's that's one of the reasons that we're that, we're, that, we're that far behind so I hadn't realised we were that bad so, so that's kind of news to me that we are that. Because I thought we were getting a lot of things right because the manager's first time round, mm. I understood that he was implementing all this really good stuff. And then, yeah. obviously, maybe Neil Lennon, whatever that happened there. But, but Ange comes in, he's doing lots of good stuff, but yet we're still miles behind. And we're still third class, Alan, compared to our peers and even people who are, who are not our peers. And I totally agree with Alan, that's who you're benchmarking against. You know, beating Aberdeen 6 nothing is all well and good. And it's an achievement, of course it is. Is it a big achievement? No, really. No, really. So you have to compare yourself with the Ajaxes and the PSVs and, the, and these kind of guys. And and we, fo- and we fall far short and we have to sort that out. That's the most important thing. Uh, you know, my biggest concern, I- I'm going to use a tiny... Uh, a right, number three at 5407. Number there, three, sorry. I'm glad we got it in. <laughs> I don't have enough time today, sorry. But the thing, the thing you mentioned there, and going back to what Alan was saying, I'm going to use a specific example, right? So we go out because we've got a system in place, a, a strategy in place for recruitment, and we buy a player called Gustav Lagerbelk, who must be a decent player. I mean, he, he just won a, an award, and we know how important they are. He just won an award last <laughs> week, right? Cool, he, must be, got me, he must be a decent player. 
But there's something not quite right if that player comes to the club and, and yeah, the deal might have been what we have termed a legacy deal or in the works, whatever. Brennan Rodgers isn't playing on Brian, right? So the, the system, the, there's flaws in the system that we are currently operating in because if the club thinks, right, he's one of these guys that, that Brennan says, you present me with a player, I'll develop them, I'll coach them, I'll make them better. And you go in and we've spent three million quid on this guy and he's playing a bounce game against Dundee last night in a testimonial where Rab Douglas ends up in goals for Celtic. And the guy whose testimonial is taking taking a belt is like, seriously, man. And we've got Gustav Lagerbilt playing centre half in this game. So there, there's flaws in there somewhere, Brian. And I do find that a wee bit concerning, like Jim says, at this stage, that these types of flaws are still in our strategy. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, I've been I've been ranting and raving about it for since I've been on that song that we don't have a, a, a structure in place. We've got an idea of what a strategy should look like, but we mm -hmm. don't. The, the only thing we should have done properly was in Angie's first season, probably, where we had a real sort of a real idea of how we're going to play and sign the appropriate players to match it for little money. But then Rogers comes in and that reverts back to zero. And then when Rogers leaves, it's got to go back again. If we yep. don't have the structure in place and the system in place and the continuity between, you know, under 12s, under 18s, reserve, whatever, up, all playing the same way, the same type of profile of player, how do you ever expect to move forward? I have rinsed other teams in the SPFL for not optimising um, what they've got and not doing the best version of what they've got. Yeah, we both we'll have to we'll, Definitely. We'll talk, we'll talk about Hibs a while ago and mm -hmm. they talk about the money they spend on players and you think, and they, they keep moaning about how they've no money. You go, well, you could address that properly. There's no reason you can be doing better at that. And we need to now look at ourselves in the and say, there's no reason we can't be doing better. And I agree with Jim. I, I don't think throwing money at it's going to going to say going to solve it either. Because if you look at how, how risk averse we are as a, a board and as a club, they're not going to do that anyway. And it might not necessarily be the answer. What I would suggested before would have been. That what's the things we can fix? So we know we can't sign the players that Atletico Madrid can buy. We know that, right? We don't have the attractiveness of playing in the Spanish league. We know that. But surely facilities, we can spend money and match the facilities. Surely the type of coaching they go under, the type of you know physical training they go under, the sports, surely we get the best that we can possibly do. Surely the facilities that Man City have, we could match. Surely the type of the you know the, the type of data analysis they do to identify players, we can try and match. The question then becomes obviously if you identify them, can you sign them? But you, there's things that we can equalize off the park to try and affect on the park, and we don't. It's a lack of strategy and a lack of optimizing what we've got. And I think we've, I've been really critical of the SPFL other teams for doing it and complaining. I kind of give us a free pass on it because we're not doing it properly. We work very well as a business. Financially, we're in Great Nick. You know, as a sort of a, a, a sort of small, medium-sized business, we're doing really, really well. Can I argue with that? But the product in the park doesn't equate to the same thing, and it is frustrating. And the big thing for me, I keep going back to though. I think what we have definitely got right is the manager. Um, now, Jim's right. You know, implementation a, a different um, aspects of the job first time round, which you know, may or may not have been continued, and that's the concern. And he's back in at the helm, and I'm confident that we've got the right guy at that at that uh, level uh, in that position. So hopefully he's able to um, inspire change. Um, K Matsu, great to have you back. No coherent strategy, simple as that. And it goes back to the attitude that players will come and go in two th to three-year cycles. If you want real success, you need stability. We've also got uh, Charlie McGar McGarvey coming in. Uh, some people are happy beating Aberdeen 6 No, I was saying this earlier to Jim. Um, some folk are quite happy just with the domestic dominance. And I say just like, like we're taking it for granted now. Some are more concerned about getting beat 6 nothing by Atletico. Uh, there are teams with worse budgets than ours who are more successful in Europe. I think what it comes down to is whether or not there is that ambition in the boardroom for European uh, progression. Or like Ian Bankier said not that long ago, um, it's too hard, so why try? Because that was his attitude. Uh, Tom Boy, thank you again for your congratulations. It means the world to us. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. It has been a busy wee week whereby we um, have somehow managed to get up the road this morning 
to host the show. And thank you to Alan, Jim and Brian for getting me through it because uh, I'm probably running on about three or four hours sleep. And how long does it take for Liverpool? About five hours in the motor up from uh, Liverpool as well. I would uh, tell you all to go and watch the Christmas ads. If Kyogo doesn't put a smile on your face, then, you know, bah humbug, uh, because it is cracking and it's all for a good cause. We will be announcing our plans for the Christmas charity weekend as well very, very soon. Thank you, every single one. Have a great weekend. And thank you to Jim, Brian and Alan for joining me on a Celtic State of Night. Cheers, Paul.